So hi everyone, thank you for joining us. Um, I'm Hannah with Springfield Community Gardens and I will be your um, chat moderator. So um, any <laughs> questions you have during this Zoom workshop, feel free to input into the chat and I will ask Patrick um, as he, as he uh, does his chat. Very good. Well, um, I'm Patrick Byers. I'm a horticulture field specialist with University of Missouri Extension, and I'm so excited to be with you here this evening to talk about strawberries. And the uh, presentation is going to be oh, focused more on a, a commercial strawberry angle, but uh, those of you who may be home gardeners interested in strawberries will be able to glean useful information as well. And as Hannah mentioned, if you have any questions whatsoever, please enter them into the chat. We'll also stop periodically for, for questions too, to, to take them. So there'll be a, a breaking points where we'll take a quick break, we'll, we'll address any questions and then we'll uh, continue on. Okay, um, I think Hannah, at this point, would you like to say a few words on behalf of Springfield Community Gardens? Yes, um, so there will be a survey at the end of this Zoom. Um, feel free to fill out the survey at the end of this Zoom workshop. And um, this is a pre-recorded workshop. Um, so for those of you watching this on YouTube, um, unfortunately we cannot answer your questions in real time, but we will uh, respond to your questions on YouTube. So thank you for joining us. And, oh, um, there's a, uh, there's the someone in the, in the chat. chat, there's no sound. So uh, other other attendees, do you have sound? Could you give us a, uh, give us a note in the chat if you, if you can hear us speaking? They have sound, yes. So it, it may be, let's see. Thank you so much for respond. Thank you guys for the feedback. Yeah, this is great. Now, um, Lori, uh, you might check your, uh, your settings. Uh, if you go down to the, uh, on the bottom there, there'll be, uh, um, in fact, Hannah, why don't, if you don't mind maybe to help Lori behind the scenes. Yeah. Okay, yeah, very good. so. Um, uh, perhaps you could do it in chat. Yes. I will go ahead and do that. Okay. Well, very good. Um, Hannah, if you'd like to go ahead and mute, thank you. Uh, we'll go ahead and get started now. And again, I wanna welcome everyone to, uh, to the, uh, the uh, webinar tonight. My name is Patrick Byers. I'm a horticulture field specialist with University of Missouri Extension. Uh, excited to be with you here tonight to talk about strawberries. Our workshop is a, a, a group effort. It's sponsored by Springfield Community Gardens, which is a community-based organization in uh, Springfield, Greene County that focuses on the development of our local food system. And I'm excited to be, uh, be teaming with them tonight. The uh, uh, program tonight is funded in part through support from the USDA, uh, several grants that, that uh, Springfield Community Gardens has received to, to help support the uh, cost of our workshops. And we'll ask you at the end of the workshop to fill out a brief Zoom survey to give us feedback on tonight's program. I promise it'll be brief, uh, no longer than five minutes, and your feedback is critically important, both to, uh, to help me understand the workshop and, and the impact of the workshop and how I can do things better, but also importantly, so that we can report back to the USDA uh, regarding the use of their funds. So please uh, co uh, cooperate with us and help us with the survey. At this point, I'll go ahead and share my screen and we'll start the presentation. Okay, Hannah, can we see the uh, presentation? Yes, it looks great. Very good, thank you. Well, again, I'm Patrick Byers, Horticulture Field Specialist with University of Missouri Extension. I'm based in Webster County in Southwest Missouri, and uh, I've spent the good, better part of my career focused on specialty crops, including fruit crops. And I'm very excited to be with you here today to be talking about strawberry production. This presentation will be focused on commercial strawberry production. If you're a home gardener, uh, stay with us. You'll find lots of useful information that uh, relates to growing strawberries in, in the uh, home garden. If anyone has any questions as we move through the presentation, please enter them into chat. And my uh, collaborator, Hannah, will be monitoring chat. I'll also, also stop periodically during the presentation to take questions at that point as well. Again, our program tonight is a collaboration with Springfield Community Gardens and the vision of Springfield Community Gardens is a community where everyone has access to healthy local food. 
Springfield Community Gardens has an innovative farmer incubator program. And if you're thinking about uh, becoming a farmer uh, at any scale and you'd like more information on that program, please reach out to Springfield Community Gardens. And our program is, a, uh, is jointly sponsored by the USDA through several grants that Springfield Community Gardens has received. The USDA is a strong supporter of local agriculture and uh, especially crop production. Visit your local farm services agency office to learn more about these programs. And in particular, the Natural Resources Conservation Service or NRCS has a number of cost share programs in place to help support specialty crop production. Risk Management Agency is another agency that you'll want to, to, uh, to learn more about from the standpoint of support for a small scale specialty crop production. And all of these resources are described further at the farmers.gov resources website. So our presentation tonight will be broken into these parts. First, we'll have some introductory material. Then we'll talk about the two primary ways that strawberries are grown in, in the Midwest. And those are the perennial matted row system and the annual plastic culture system. We'll talk a bit about growing strawberries in high tunnels. This is a relatively recent development and I think offers good potential for uh, farmers here in the Midwest. We'll talk about strawberry integrated pest management. We'll talk about harvest and post-harvest handling of strawberries. And then we'll talk about marketing strawberries. And then we'll end with some thoughts on the economics of strawberry production. Again, as we go through the material, if you have any questions, please enter them into chat. Anna will be moderating the chat and she will let me know if there are any questions. So why would a farmer or a home gardener for that matter, consider growing strawberries? Well, first of all, of course, it's a well-known and desirable fruit. We have a long history of successful commercial production of strawberries here in, in, in uh, Missouri. And in fact, if we were to step back 75 to 100 years, we would find a much larger scale strawberry industry in, in Missouri and especially in Southwest Missouri. It's a valuable crop with good profit potential. It's also a crop that returns that potential in a short period of time. Uh, generally, the uh, return on investment, the payback period, is within a year of planting the strawberries. They're relatively easy to grow. There are a number of marketing venues that are available for strawberry farmers. And there's also good potential for strawberries to be uh, a sole ingredient or a part of a value-added product, which again can, can further uh, enhance the uh, profit potential of strawberries on the farm. Of course, there is the, the rest of the story. Uh, as is the case with all specialty crops, there is an economic risk to growing strawberries. Uh, things can happen, uh, things that can adversely affect the profit potential of strawberries on the farm. The plantings are short-lived. Even with the perennial matted row plantings, typically we're talking about a three to five year productive lifespan of a planting. The crop is labor intensive. The uh, plants are vulnerable to environmental problems. And yes, we can manage some of this particular risk but there are still some underlying aspects relative to environmental vulnerability of growing strawberries. <clears throat> there are pest and disease issues to consider with strawberries. And then of course, weed management is a primary consideration with uh, strawberries. Now, anyone who's considering growing strawberries, either on a commercial scale or in the home garden should learn some terminology. And there are some specialized terms that you'll hear me use tonight. And you'll hear, uh, you'll also, see these terms when you read about strawberries or visit websites related to strawberries. So let's go through some of these definitions. Uh, when we plant a strawberry, we typically consider that original plant to be the mother plant, okay? The mother plant is made up of a root system, it's made up of a crown area, and then the uh, foliage which eventually develops after it's been planted. These mother plants produce runners. Runners are a specialized above ground stem and at intervals on the length of the runner, there are what are called daughter plants. You know, sometimes there's as many as two or three daughter plants per runner. And a single mother plant can produce a number of runners. Now in botanical terms, these runners are called stolons. Strawberries also will divide, the, the original crown will divide and form what are called branch crowns. And if we look at this upper picture, and if we look closely, we can actually see four to five branch crowns in this established strawberry plant. You know, the original plant was a single crown, but over time, additional crowns will form around the original mother plant. Let's talk about strawberry foliage. Uh, strawberries have a compound leaf, and there are typically three leaflets to each leaf. And in, again, in botanical terms, this is called a trifoliate leaf. And the reason I mention this, 
is that when we talk about foliar testing of strawberries, I'll talk about collecting the most recently developed fully expanded trifoliate leaf. And that's what we're talking about. We also talk about the leaf petiole, and that is the uh, stem that connects the trifoliate leaf to the crown of the plant. Okay, you can think of that as the leaf stem. And this is important because in some cases we actually collect leaf petioles to do nutrient analysis. Now let's take a look at strawberry blossoms and developing fruit. The upper picture is a close-up of a strawberry blossom, and these are the primary parts that, that uh, are, we're interested in as strawberry farmers. First of all, of course, the, the petals around the strawberry flower. There's usually five to eight petals on a strawberry flower. The, uh, yeah, within the center of the flower, we have both the male and the female reproductive parts. The male reproductive parts are called the stamens, and the stamens produce pollen. The uh, center of the strawberry contains a number of pistils. And if you look closely at a strawberry blossom, you'll notice the, the structures, they're yellow or golden, and they are on the surface of the receptacle. Okay, the receptacle is actually uh, uh, a, a portion of the female part of the flower, but it doesn't actually contain the reproductive structures. Those are contained within the pistil. And each receptacle will have quite a large number of pistils present on it. And in order for pollination and fruit development to take place, the pollen must move from the stamen to the pistil. Now, if we look a little closer at uh, the development of early development of strawberry fruit, we can see that in the lower picture. Again, we can see a blossom in the center. In the upper left, we see a blossom that has been pollinated and lost its uh, uh, petals. And then in the lower right, we see a developing berry. Now, again, uh, pollination is necessary for the development of the berry. And as we'll see here in a moment, each one of those pistils will develop into an individual seed. And there must be sufficient pollination, a sufficient number of pistils that are pollinated, and a sufficient number of seeds developing to give us a uniform large size in berries. We also sometimes hear the terms primary, secondary, and tertiary when we talk about strawberries. And this reflects the, uh, the uh, blossom and fruit order on a cluster of berries. And a cluster of berries, a cluster of blossoms, and, and eventually a cluster of berries is called a truss. And within the truss, we have, first of all, the primary blossom. This is the blossom that develops first. You can see it there at the uh, very center. Uh, not as noticeable as I had hoped in this picture, but that is the first blossom within that truss to open. And typically, it has the potential to produce the earliest ripening berry within that truss. And in many cases, with many cultivars, it's the largest berry within the truss. So primary berries are, are quite important from the standpoint of overall productivity. The uh, second group of berries that develop are called the secondaries. And within a truss, there's typically two secondaries. And you can see those noted here in the picture as well. And then we frequently have what are called tertiaries. The tertiaries develop below the secondaries. And you can see these here represented as blossoms. Now again, notice the primary will be the first berry to ripen. The secondaries will be the second flush of fruit to ripen on that plant. And then the tertiaries will be the, uh, the third and sometimes the final berries to ripen. Now with many cultivars, we have a decreasing rank of, of size from the primary to the tertiary. Other cultivars, the size of the berries is quite uniform across primaries, secondaries, and tertiaries. And then if we take a close look at ripe berries, uh, first of all, the, the green area at the base of the blossoms is called the calyx. And there's usually a stem attached to the calyx if the berries have been properly harvested. Looking more closely at the fruit itself, each of those individual seeds is called an achene. Okay, and as I mentioned before, we have to have a sufficient number of achenes developing on the berry to give us a uniform large berry. If for some reason we don't have complete pollination or perhaps we have frost damage that, that damages the developing achenes, we can have misshapen uh, distorted berries. And then the receptacle tissue, the part of the berry that we actually enjoy, the part that is sweet, juicy, and delicious is the receptacle tissue. Again, the overall experience of eating a strawberry is a combination of eating the achenes, which give it a bit of crunchiness, and the uh, deliciousness of the receptacle tissue. Now we should talk about different types of strawberries as well. And the strawberry is a very interesting plant. And there are still some aspects of the physiology of strawberries that are not completely understood. But we do know that there are two broad types of strawberries 
that are grown commercially and also in home gardens. And these are the June bearing strawberry, sometimes it's called the spring bearing strawberry. With this type of strawberry, the flower buds actually initiate in the crowns in response to the length of the day. The day has to reach a, a critical length of time or a shorter length of time. And again, that critical length is somewhere around 14 hours for flower buds to develop. And with June bearing strawberries, this typically happens in the fall, usually sometime in, in September and then on into the fall, or it happens in the spring as the strawberries begin to break dormancy before the days become too long. The June bearing strawberry is the backbone of matted row perennial production. Um, they also, uh, June bearing strawberries are also used in uh, plastic culture as well. Again, this type of, of uh, strawberry is the most commonly grown type of strawberry in the Midwest, both in field production and also in production in high tunnels. Another type of strawberry is the day neutral or the ever bearing strawberry. With this type of strawberry, flower buds will form throughout the season. They're not formed in response to day length. We also have forming what are called branch crowns as we defined earlier with this type of strawberry. Now, there is a, an important caveat relative to day neutral strawberry production in, in the Midwest. Whenever we have temperatures above 86 degrees Fahrenheit, we actually see an inhibition of flower bud development. So one of the, the uh, attractive aspects of day neutral strawberries is that they will continue to, to produce blossoms and fruit throughout the growing season. Again, as long as temperatures are not warm enough to inhibit the mechanism that forms flower buds. Day neutral strawberries have not been grown to the extent that uh, June bearing strawberries have to the Midwest, but there are some in, uh, places where day neutral strawberries could be a profit center on, on a uh, uh, specialty crop farm. We should also talk about planting stock. You know, there's two basic types of ways that you can establish a strawberry planting. And one way is to work with dormant plants, and those are called bare root plants, and we can see those in that lower picture there. These are typically dug from a strawberry uh, nursery uh, sometime during the winter, and then they're held in a dormant state, shipped to, to a farmer, and then they're planted in the spring. The other type of nursery stock are what are called plug plants. And plug plants are typically actively growing plants. They're usually developed from what are called runner tips. These are those daughter plants that we described earlier. And the runner tips, the daughter plants are collected, they're rooted, and then the rooted plug plants are planted typically in the fall. With uh, plug, plug plants, this is the way that we frequently will establish annual uh, strawberry plantings. There are other types of, of uh, nursery stock. There are what are called uh, uh, bare root growing plants that are sometimes uh, available, but in general in the Midwest, most of our plantings are established with either bare root plants or with plug plants. Now, very important to, to uh, source nursery plants of any type that are clean and disease-free. Uh, reputable nurseries will have in place programs to test plants for the presence of diseases and particularly for the presence of virus diseases. And then if, if these uh, diseases are present, they'll go to great pains to develop production fields and nursery fields that are, that are free of these pests. These are, this is called clean planting stock, and it's an excellent way to start off a commercial or, or a home strawberry planting as well. So again, do that background check. Make sure that the nursery stock that you're purchasing has been tested for diseases and viruses. And then there's, there's two basic ways that we grow strawberries in the Midwest. Uh, one is a perennial system. We can see that in the upper picture there. The common way that we do this is called the perennial matted row system. These plantings are established in the spring from dormant plants, and they typically have a productive life of four to five years. The other system is our, our what are called annual systems. In the annual plastic culture system is the primary annual system used in the Midwest. With this system, uh, actively growing plants, those plug plants we saw earlier, are planted in the fall. The uh, planting overwinters, it produces fruit the following spring, and then it's discarded. It's, it's truly an annual system. Okay, Hannah, do we have any questions at this point as far as, as understanding strawberries and some terminology? Uh, not so far, but feel free to enter any questions you may have in the chat. Thank you. Okay, let's, let's have some general thoughts now about strawberries, regardless of whether you're growing them as a perennial matted row planting or as an annual planting. Uh, a good strawberry site has full sun, 
uh, typically elevate sites are the better sites. Uh, elevated sites have less risk from the standpoint of uh, late spring frost. Consider the previous uses of the site. Uh, strawberries should not be planted after strawberries and strawberries should not be planted after solanaceous crops like tomatoes, potatoes, eggplants, or peppers. Um, also, uh, it's not a good idea to plant strawberries after bramble crops like raspberries or blackberries. All of these crops, uh, bramble crops, uh, solanaceous crops or strawberries share common soil-borne diseases. And so it's a good practice to, to allow for a rotation, a period of time between planting strawberries following these crops. And typically that rotation should be four to five years. Uh, strawberry planting should be close to a source of water. Uh, the soil should be well-drained and slightly acidic and moderately fertile. Obviously we need a soil test to give us a clear understanding of the uh, chemistry of the soil. It's also helpful to test the soil for harmful nematodes and to think about how the strawberry crop is going to be marketed. Are we going to market the crop on farm? If that's the case, then we need to have a sufficient resident population to support the size farm that we're considering. Or perhaps the farm is located near an attraction that brings people to the area. If we're marketing off farm, let's consider the distance from the farm to the market, be it a farmer's market, uh, a, a pickup point for a CSA, or perhaps even a larger scale market to an institution, a school, or a hospital. Preparing a strawberry site should take place the year before planting. Okay, typically the first step is to test the soil. Uh, secondly, of course, is to prepare the site from the relative, uh, from the aspects of clearing away existing vegetation or other cover. Uh, apply soil amendments as indicated by the soil test, eliminate perennial weeds, and then determine what the planting system is going to be. Will this be a perennial matted row system or will this be an annual plastic culture system? Okay, uh, the next series of slides is focused on the perennial matted row system. This is the traditional way the strawberries were grown in uh, Missouri. It's still a viable system for the standpoint of strawberry production. And uh, as we'll see here in a moment, offers several advantages. Patrick, we have a question. Um, in regards to a photo, a previous photo from Linda Orton, um, are the plants show in the photo with people picking them the perennial, perennial variety? I've never seen so many plants at large. Yes, uh, this picture, or the picture that we, hold on, I'll move back a slide. This picture is a perennial matted row system, and this is actually in the second year of production in this planting. And yes, uh, a well-managed perennial row a well-managed matted row perennial planting will generate rows that look like this. And in fact, one aspect of managing perennial matted row is to keep the width of the rows in bounds. The most productive part of a row of strawberries is the area along the edges. So we don't want rows that are too wide. Obviously we want rows that are healthy and vigorous, but we don't want them to be too wide. We also have to allow sufficient room to operate in the planting. If it's a pick your own planting, there needs to be enough room in the planting for pickers to move between the rows without stepping on berries. But yes, this is indeed a perennial matted row. Nancy Chapman says, guessing they are on hills. I'm sorry, I missed that. Nancy Chapman says, um, guessing that they are on hills. Yes, we'll talk more about uh, laying out a planting here in a moment. But yes, the, in this planting, the uh, matted row was established on raised beds. That's it on the chat. Thank you. So why consider perennial matted row? Well, first of all, the initial cost is less than, than establishing a uh, annual plastic culture system. There are fewer plants uh, initially and dormant plants tend to be less expensive than plug plants. Yes, there is some risk, but less risk than with annual plastic culture. And a good part of the, uh, the aspect of the reduced risk relates to the fact that we have more plants present in the planting. And even if we, uh, for example, do lose a portion of the crop to a spring frost, this can be offset by the fact that we have more plants and uh, more flower trusses developing within that planting. And with this system, of course, it's a perennial system. You don't have to plant it every uh, production cycle. And a bed should last for three to five picking seasons. There are a large number of cultivars that are adapted to the, the uh, perennial matted row system in Missouri. These are the standard cultivars. There are many others that could be considered. For the early season, this includes Early Glow, Annapolis, and AC Windy. 
Mid-season cultivars include Honey Eye, All Star, Red Chief, and Guardian. Late season cultivars include Lake Glow and Winona. Typically, a given cultivar will produce berries for a two to three week picking season. Preparing a site for a perennial matted row, as we mentioned earlier, the first step is to, uh, to uh, conduct a soil test and modify the soil if needed. Critically important with perennial matted row to control weeds. We don't have the benefit of uh, uh, plastic mulch with perennial matted row. And so weed control frequently comes down to good pre-plant site preparation, and then the use of herbicides and the use of, uh, of uh, hand labor and tillage to manage weeds. Cover crops and organic amendments are very helpful. Uh, if the soil test indicates a soil organic matter content level below 5%, then supplement that with cover crops and organic amendments. Uh, Pre-plant fertilizer application is very helpful, and this is a standard practice about 30 pounds of nitrogen, 60 pounds of phosphorus, and 60 pounds of potassium. Uh, these can be applied in the form of organic fertilizers or in the form of conventional fertilizers. The site should then be worked and then uh, strongly consider using raised beds. And with uh, annual or with uh, perennial matted row strawberries, the beds are typically spaced 42 to 52 inches and apart and are typically six to eight inches high. We'll pause for a moment while the train gets by me. Can you tell I live close to the train tracks? <laughs> now, we mentioned earlier that irrigation or the availability of water is critical. And primarily we're talking about irrigation here. Now, when the beds are created, then the, that's the time to install the irrigation. And in many cases, the irrigation line can be installed at the same time that the plants are planted. In other cases, the bed will be created and the irrigation line laid at that point, and then the strawberries will then be planted back into the bed after that takes place. Typically, we're talking about eight uh, mill tube. Uh, it's a, a uh, uh, type of irrigation that has a shorter lifespan, but long enough for, uh, for again, the, the, uh, the three to five production cycles of a perennial matted row planting. The emitters should be spaced eight to 12 inches apart on the uh, eight mil tube. Generally, we allow one to two irrigation lines per bed. And typically these uh, types of irrigation lines will deliver about 0.4 gallons per minute or 24 gallons per hour per 100 feet. This is pretty standard to supply enough water for, uh, for uh, the perennial matted row strawberry planting. When you lay the drip tape, it should be laid with the orifices facing upward. This helps reduce problems with uh, uh, the movement of, of soil into the, uh, the irrigation line. It can be buried one to two inches deep. If you bury it, of course, it's not as important whether or not the orifices are facing upwards or, or downwards. And then once the lines are in place, tie them off at the ends until they're connected to the uh, header line at the ends of the rows. The uh, perennial matted row plantings are typically planted in April or May using dormant crowns. The rows 42 to 52 inches apart, and generally a single row of plants is planted per row, and the uh, plants are spaced 12 to 24 inches apart. Now, the spacing between plants depends to some extent on when you're planting. Uh, probably the, the best month to plant strawberries is in April, and if you're planting in April, there's plenty of time for the plants to become established and to develop a sufficient quantity of runners and daughter plants to fill the row in. If you're delayed in planting till say late May, then it's important to plant the strawberries more closely together. Uh, I may have just misspoken. Uh, in the case of early planting, you can space them further apart. In the case of late planting, you can space them more closely together. And then water the plants immediately after planting to get them established and off to a good start. Let's talk about managing a new planting of matted row strawberries. Uh, probably the most important aspect of success with matted row strawberries is weed control. And this is, could, could not be more important than it is during the year of establishment. And there's a lot of open ground around the mother plants that have been planted. In time, it will be filled in with daughter plants and the uh, competition of the daughter plants will help suppress weed growth. But until that happens, we have to manage germinating weeds, both annual and perennial weeds. Irrigation is important as well to keep the uh, new stand of strawberry plants growing. 
Uh, strawberry plants typically will arrive as dormant crowns with flower buds already developed within those crowns. So when they're planted, they begin to grow and they begin to form flower trusses. But it's a good management practice to remove those flower trusses, as we can see in this picture here, during the establishment year. By removing those flower trusses, we encourage good, strong growth of the mother plant. And we also encourage the formation of runners and more daughter plants, which will fill in the area between the original mother plants. Uh, fertilization is important with the establishment year. So about four weeks after transplanting, apply about 30 to 60 pounds of nitrogen per acre. Again, this can be in the, uh, the form of an organic fertilizer. And then again, in late August to early September, an additional 30 pounds of nitrogen per acre is very helpful. This is what we don't want to see. Here's a new planting of perennial matted rose strawberries. And again, we can see that in this case, the weeds are, are very quickly getting out of hand. Annual germinating weeds are best controlled and they're very small, whether or not we're using an organic herbicide or we're using tillage or, or other means of controlling weeds. But we have to manage weeds in strawberry plantings, particularly during the establishment year. And just to show you how prolific the original mother plants can be in the formation of runners and daughter plants. Uh, this is actually in the second year of a planting, but again, we, we see a profusion of runners and daughter plants forming, which do an excellent job of filling in the spaces between the original mother plants. Now, as we move into the fall, we don't wanna let down our guard as fall as fall weed control. You know, typically when we plant strawberries in the spring, then we face the onslaught of warm season weeds. But in the fall, we face the onslaught of cool season weeds. So don't let down your guard from the standpoint of weed control as the strawberry planting moves into the fall. Now, strawberry plants are not particularly hardy and it's a, a, an excellent cultural practice to protect strawberry plants from damage during the winter, particularly during periods of deep cold. In the case of perennial matted rose strawberries, it's a common practice to mulch the strawberries with either straw or to use uh, row covers. In the case of straw, we need about two and a half to three tons of straw per acre, and that'll give us the needed two to three inch deep mulch over the tops of the plants. If we're, if we're purchasing small bales, that's about 300 small bales per acre. If we're using row covers, uh, we wanna use heavyweight row covers, 1.0 to 1.5 ounces per square yard row covers. And uh, regardless of whether we're using straw or row cover, we wanna monitor the uh, protection during the winter. In the case of straw, it can be blown off by winter winds. And in the case of row covers, we wanna make sure that the edges have been well anchored uh, using uh, bags of rocks or sandbags or some other means to maintain the uh, protection on the plants over the winter. Here's what the strawberry plants should look like in the late fall before applying the mulch. We don't wanna apply mulch too early. The uh, typical time to apply mulch is between, Chris, uh, between uh, Thanksgiving and the first week in December. We need to have several uh, killing frosts. We need the plants to go dormant. Basically, we wanna see the plants lay down as we can see in this picture here. So this planting is ready for the application of, of mulch, either straw or, uh, or floating row covers. And here we see the uh, farm team spreading mulch over the strawberries. They're covering the rows first and then they'll come back and fill in the area between the rows. Keep in mind that strawberries on raised beds will actually require more in the way of straw from the standpoint of protection because you have a raised area of the soil that also needs to be protected with uh, an effective mulch. So you'll require additional straw to fill the areas between the rows with, uh, with uh, raised beds. And here we see a field that has been protected with uh, floating row cover. And again, we're using heavyweight row cover, we're placing it over the rows, and we're anchoring the edges, in this case, with, uh, with rock bags. We'll talk more about floating row covers when we talk about annual plastic culture strawberries. Now, uh, we've moved through the winter, now we're moving into the spring. As growth begins, the mulch will be removed, whether it's straw or floating row cover. We, of course, need to think about frost management. In Missouri, strawberries flower in April, and they are certainly exposed to the risk of damage from late spring frosts. Pollination management is another important consideration, which we'll discuss here in a moment. And then we move into integrated pest management, the management of diseases and insects in the spring. We'll talk more about that a little bit later on in the presentation. And we'll discuss harvest later on in the presentation as well. 
So some more thoughts on cold injury. So the, uh, the uh, risk of frost damage increases as we move further along in the development of the strawberry plants. Uh, what this means, of course, is that a plant that is completely dormant is quite frost tolerant. But as development commences and, and continues, the, the more developed the uh, blossom is, for example, the more vulnerable it is to frost damage at increasingly lower, uh, increasingly higher temperatures. You know, for example, a strawberry blossom that is not opened can endure temperatures into the, uh, the upper 20s. But a strawberry blossom that is fully open or a developing fruit can be damaged at temperatures near 30. So again, when we assess the risk of a, 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 fr a predicted frost, we want to look at the growth stage of the plants to get a feel for uh, what the anticipated damage might be. Within the blossom, the pistils are damaged first, and that's unfortunate because pollination of the pistils and their development is necessary for fruit development. If we look at that lower picture, that's, this is what's called a, a black-eyed flower. This flower went through a frost uh, uh, situation where the uh, pistils and the receptacle tissue was damaged. The uh, stamens and the blossoms, or the stamens and the uh, petals were undamaged, but unfortunately, with the damage that was suffered by the pistils and the receptacle, that flower were not developed into a fruit. Now, to help manage frost, don't uncover the, uh, the planting uh, too early in the case of matted row, but don't uncover it too late, uh, especially if you're using row covers. Row covers can actually encourage early development. And if we start to see development within the plants, then it's time to uncover the, uh, the plants. And then we have ways that we can apply, that we can, we can manage frost through frost protection. Traditionally, this was done through the use of overhead sprinklers that uh, sprinkled water onto the blossoms and the developing fruit. And as long as the, uh, the application of water was continued, as that water freezes on the blossoms and the fruit, it releases a small amount of latent heat and this small amount of latent heat is enough to protect the blossoms and the developing fruit from frost. And this is effective down into the mid 20s. Another way to manage frost is to replace the mulch, either the straw mulch, which is uh, quite frankly, uh, not easy to do, or by applying the floating row covers, which is much more easy and, and much more practical way to manage frost. In some cases during deep frosts, farmers have combined the use of floating row covers and overhead sprinkler uh, sprinklers to get additional protection. <clears throat> uh, a few comments about pollination. As I mentioned earlier, it's very important for a strawberry blossom to be sufficiently pollinated to develop large uniform berries. Uh, the uh, strawberry is self-fertile, which means that pollination can take place within the blossom or within blossoms on the same plant. But research and growers experience have demonstrated that while yes, some pollination can take place through, through uh, the movement of the blossom in the wind, it's important to have adequate insect pollination to ensure uh, uniform large fruit. It's a common practice for strawberry farmers to, to bring hives into the uh, strawberry field. Typically, the uh, stocking rate is about two hives per acre and the hives are placed at about 10% bloom and they're left in place through the duration of flowering. Now, very important if uh, uh, insecticides or even, even other pesticides are used during this period of time, because bees are, are, are vulnerable to, to injury or even death from, from a number of different types of pesticides. So uh, regardless of whether they're, they're organic pesticides or conventional pesticides, always err on the side of caution if you're applying a material during flowering. And no insecticides should be used during the flowering period on strawberries. Now, we'll talk about uh, harvest uh, a little bit later on in the presentation. In the case of perennial matted row, this is a perennial planting. And so we can keep it for more than one harvest cycle. So after harvest, it's important to go out and evaluate the condition of the bed. Again, this is done after the last harvest. Uh, the farmer will go out, take a look at the uh, matted row. If the plants are healthy and if there's good coverage in the bed, then it's, it's uh, uh, likely that that planting will be profitable during the next production cycle. If the bed is thin, if there are disease issues, or if there are weeds that cannot be controlled, it may be time to discard that bed and to start production in a fresh area. If the uh, decision is made to keep the bed, then renovation is helpful. We'll talk more about that here in a moment, but renovation is a way to, to uh, renew the vigor of the bed. Weed control, critically important throughout the growth cycle. And then if the uh, bed is to be kept, uh, fertilization takes place during renovation. And then again in August or September, 20 to 30 pounds of nitrogen per acre at each time. 
So here would be an example of the decision-making process. This is a strawberry bed. This is actually moving into its third production year. And if we look in this bed, we can see, first of all, uh, yes, we do have strawberries present, but we also have some issues. The uh, light colored greenish looking weed is uh, nut sedge. Nut sedge is extremely difficult to manage in strawberry beds, uh, particularly organically. And if we had a, a, a sufficient stand of nut sedge, that could be a strong reason to consider discarding this planting and moving on to a new production site where the nut sedge has been eliminated. We also notice that this planting is patchy. There are areas where we don't have strawberries growing. We can see that in the foreground of the picture. Typically, a strawberry bed needs to have about 70% coverage during this post-harvest period as we move into renovation. If it has less than 70% coverage, then it's a, a good practice to, to uh, discard that planting and start a new bed of strawberries. So renovation, we've, we've examined the bed. We've, we've decided that it's worth keeping this planting for another production cycle. Now we consider renovation. It takes place at the end of harvest. First step, if necessary, we can mow the foliage off. And this is typically done with string trimmers. Uh, an indication to mow the foliage off would be the presence of leaf diseases. The planting rows are then narrowed to 10 to 15 inches in width. And this is frequently done by hand with hose or it can be done with tillers. We then place an inch of soil over the bed, fertilize the bed again with 20 to 30 pounds of nitrogen per acre, and then we irrigate as necessary to, to begin the bed uh, into the process of, uh, of uh, reestablishment and renewal. If we're willing to put some energy into renovation, it can be a very important aspect in maintaining the productivity and vigor and the profitability of a matted row planting. What would be the expected yield from a matted row planting? Uh, the experience in Missouri is that we can expect 12 to 15,000 pounds of strawberries per acre uh, from most of the cultivars that are recommended for perennial matted row plantings in Missouri. There have been cases where farmers have ex experienced exceptional yields uh, up to 25,000 pounds per acre, but this would be exceptional. It, it, again, probably better to consider uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 12 to 15,000 pounds per acre as being a typical yield from a perennial matted row strawberry planting. Okay, Hannah, do we have any questions related to perennial matted row strawberries? Uh, we do. From uh, So first, Angie Fitz asked if, um, if we could go back to the spring prep slide. Um, however, this will be posted on our Facebook and on YouTube by tomorrow. So uh, everyone will be able to have access to this workshop later. Um, Nancy Chapman asks, putting one inch of soil doesn't hurt the crown depth, does it? That's an excellent question, Nancy. What happens in strawberry plantings is that the crowns tend to actually, that they don't actually work themselves out of the soil, but the soil tends to recede around the crown. And by placing an additional inch of soil back over the bed, this actually puts the strawberry plants at a, at a more, uh, uh, you know, at a better depth of growing and you get better uh, production from that planting if you're willing to do that. So again, it's a good practice to place some, some additional soil back over the bed during renovation. Awesome, that's it on the chat. Okay, very good. Now let's talk about annual plastic culture. And this is a relatively new way of growing strawberries in the Midwest. This system was developed in the uh, southeastern US and in Florida based upon production practices in California. And it's only in the past 15 to 20 years that we've seen the adoption of annual plastic culture in the colder parts of where strawberries are grown. It's certainly a system that can be successful across Missouri. Uh, as we'll see here in a moment, there are some challenges, but we're seeing increasingly an emphasis on annual plastic culture strawberry production. So why would you consider annual plastic culture? Uh, this type of a planting typically gives an earlier and a longer season of, of harvest. The uh, quality and size of the berries is enhanced with annual plastic culture, and it's also an easier system from the standpoint of harvest, both for pick your own customers and for those uh, harvesters who are picking pre-picked berries. Again, an excellent option for pre-picked uh, or uh, pick your own berries. The fruit is cleaner. We'll see why here in a moment. There is less fruit disease. There's no berry to soil contact. This has uh, implications from the standpoint of clean berries, but it also has implications from the standpoint of produce food safety. It's also a, a very productive system. 
Uh, the goal with these systems typically is to have 35 successful blossoms per plant, which equals about one and a half pounds of berries per plant, which is the equivalent of about 26,250 pounds of production per acre. Now, will every annual plastic culture planting yield 26,250 pounds per acre? Uh, the, the answer is, is likely no, but this is still a, 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 a uh, goal that, that can be achieved with annual plastic culture systems here in Missouri. Patrick, we have a couple of questions. Yes. Um, we, first, we have a, um, uh, a man named Paul has raised his hand and uh, would like to chat. Um, would you yeah, like Paul, to? Yeah, Paul, if you'd like to unmute, please. Let me see if I can help him with that. Okay, and um, we have another question let's see, from Rita. Rita asks, where to buy the cultivators you mentioned for the home garden? So the, uh, the strawberry cultivars that I mentioned earlier uh, are, are actually widely available. These are standard cultivars that have been available for many years and they should be easy to find. Now, there are a group of nurseries that focus on berry crops and in some cases strawberries in particular. And I like to refer people who are looking for sources for plants to uh, Cornell University's Berry Nursery site. So if you go in and do a quick Google search for Berry Nursery Cornell, it will bring up that site. This is a very helpful site. Not only does it list uh, nursery sources, but it actually breaks them into the specific cultivars and where they're, they're available as far as nursery sources. So that's an excellent place to go to, to uh, source a particular cultivar. Um, Paul, I have, I have um, messaged you in the chat. It appears as though we cannot unmute him, um, unfortunately, um, but I would, I would be glad to um, accept your question via chat. Yeah, Paul, if you don't mind, go ahead and type your question into chat. Um, there's also a Q&A option if, you, if that is more comfortable for you as well. Um, just give it a couple of seconds. Um, that's it on the chat for now. Okay, well, we have another train coming by, so <laughs> let's pause for just a moment. Okay. Okay, well, what is the rest of the story relative to annual plastic culture? It is a system that has, has uh, high initial inputs. The high initial investment is about $10,000 per acre. It's a system that uh, the success depends upon the production skill of the grower. There are many production decisions that must be made in a very timely fashion and practices carried out in a timely fashion for annual plastic culture to succeed. Uh, labor management is very important. As I said before, when jobs have to be done, they have to be done. Uh, you're producing a lot of berries. So obviously it's important that the grower not only be a good grower, but also a good marketer. Uh, the uh, system certainly has the risk of crop failure. It, it's vulnerable to excessive rain. It's vulnerable to spring frost. It's vulnerable to spring heat waves. And it's particularly vulnerable to weather conditions that would delay planting in the fall. As we'll see here in a moment, fall planting time is critical. And if we're delayed even by as little as two to three weeks, it can result in lower productivity. And in, in the overall scheme of things, plastic culture production is much riskier than matted row production. A number of cultivars are adapted to annual plastic culture production in Missouri. The uh, top three are the uh, cultivars that have been most widely planted and Chandler by far is the dominant cultivar for annual plastic culture. But we're seeing interest in moving beyond Chandler, Camarosa, and Sweet Charlie. And farmers are planting Rocco, Liz, Ruby June, Flavor Fest, and Sweet Anne as, as a, a June bearing cultivars. And there's also some interest in growing day neutral cultivars with annual plastic culture. These include San Andreas and Albion. Now, as far as uh, preparing a site and getting ready for annual plastic culture, the first order of business is to order plug plants early. If you're ordering plug plants from a nursery that specializes in plug plants, that order should go in at least six months before planting. Earlier is better. Uh, it is possible to grow your own, and if that's the case, you need to get your plug tips ordered early so that you be sure of, of the, uh, the supply of good quality uh, 
uh, Brenner tips if you're going to grow your own. Test your site from the standpoint of the soil and modify the soil if needed. Uh, control weeds. Uh, Pre-plant fertilization. It's a common practice to apply 60 pounds of actual nitrogen per acre before raising the beds for annual plasticulture. Okay, and again, this can be put down as, an, as a, an organic or as a conventional fertilizer. And if the soil test indicates the need for additional nutrients, apply those as well. And then we create the raised beds. With annual plastic culture, the beds are typically about 30 inches wide and they're about six to 10 inches high. Typically it's a higher bed than we use for perennial matted row. The bed is covered with plastic mulch, plastic film mulch, and the rows are spaced five to six feet apart. Now, uh, some additional comments on plug plants. If you're a new grower, if you're, you're just starting out an annual plastic culture, strongly consider purchasing your plug plants rather than growing your own. This is a way to help manage risk and you also don't have to deal with, with growing plug plants out at the same time you'll be doing other things to prepare the site for growing, growing the straw, for establishing and growing this, the uh, strawberries. Plug plants cost somewhere in the neighborhood of 30 cents each, uh, plus or minus. You'll need about 14,500 plants per acre. And again, that's an investment of about $4,350 per acre. Whenever possible, source these plug plants from a nursery that uh, has a program in place to, to virus test and disease test their plug plants. And again, order your plants early, a minimum of four months, six months is even better. Here is an example of a farmer growing their own plug plants. And again, these are purchased as runner tips. The runner tips are sourced from nurseries that specialize in the production of runner tips. They arrive in a, 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 in a situation where they've been maintaining cold storage. And as soon as they arrive, the runner tips are stuck into trays of growing media. And these trays have 50 cells per, plat, per flat. And each cell you place a runner tip. And then they have to be managed carefully from the standpoint of water and nutrition and disease management to get them established and up and growing vigorously. Typically, uh, an ideal plug plant is about four weeks old at planting time. Again, as I said before, uh, if you're a new grower, strongly consider ordering plug plants that are ready to plant. And again, the raised beds are five to six uh, a foot on center, 30 inches wide, six to 10 inches high. Uh, higher beds are helpful because they keep the fruit cleaner and they also help hold heat in the bed in the winter. The uh, raised beds are covered with a 1.25 mil black embossed plastic mulch. And then a drip line, a trickle line is placed on top of the bed, but underneath the plastic mulch. Now with this system, other than the pre-plant fertilizer, all nutrients needed by the strawberry planting are injected into the irrigation lines. Again, this is done through fertigation. And here's what a planting would look like as we're getting ready to, to prepare, uh, as uh, the, the planning has been prepared for, uh, for a strawberry planting that'll take place a little bit later on. So again, this typically takes place in July and August where the uh, planning is made ready for the placement of the plug plants as we move into September. Now, some more comments on the irrigation. Again, eight mil tube, put down when the plastic is laid, eight to 12 inches between the emitter points on the uh, eight mil tube, one to two lines per bed. Uh, installed with the orifices facing upwards. They can be buried and they're tied off at the end until they're hooked up. And we can see here in this uh, picture here how the, uh, the ends of the line have been tied off. In this case, the strawberries have been planted. You can see the, uh, the newly planted strawberry plug plants in place. We'll talk more about that here in a moment. Here's the plug plants. Again, they're, they're planted in early September and planting time is critical here in Missouri. Uh, try to, to focus on the period of time around Labor Day for planting annual plastic culture plantings in Missouri. Typically, uh, plantings of any scale are planted with what are called water wheel transplanters. We'll see one here in a moment. The uh, plants are, are planted in double rows on the uh, raised bed that's covered with the plastic film, and the uh, plants within the rows are staggered. A cover crop is frequently planted between the rows. And remember that earlier picture we saw the annual ryegrass growing between the rows? It's important that the seed be broadcast and uh, uh, placed on the soil before planting. In fact, it's a good practice to go back. Uh, uh, well, the, the sequence of operations, again, is to, to uh, create the, the planting, the raised bed rows with the plastic covered raised beds, 
spread the seed, go back and brush the seed off of the beds into the areas between the rows. We don't want that seed moving into the soil around the newly planted plug plants or it will become a, a serious uh, weed competition for the, new, the uh, newly established plug plants. So make sure that all the seed is brushed off the top of the raised bed before we plant the plug plants. Again, planting date is critically important. If you plant too early, let's say that you, for whatever reason, want to plant in August, remember that early planting can lead to possible excessive plant growth. Uh, in other words, too many branch crowns, we can see excessive runnering. And once we get up to the point of eight crowns per plant, we actually see a negative impact on fruit size the following year. So we don't want to plant too early. Uh, on the other hand, we don't want to plant too late. If we plant too late, we just don't have enough time in the fall growing season to develop plants that are of sufficient size to give good yield the following spring. Uh, if we plant just right, if we hit the window just right, first of all, yes, we'll have some runnering where runners have to be removed, but it'll be manageable. We'll see the ideal number of three to five branch crowns the next spring, and we'll have, again, our goal of about 35 fruit per plant. That's our target. So we don't want to plant too early. We don't want to plant too late. We want to time it just right. And again, for most farmers in Missouri, that just right period is going to be in early September. Some more thoughts on what the planting is going to look like. Again, 16 to 18 inches between the rows, and then the plants are spaced 12 to 15 inches apart within the row. And if we look at this picture here, we can see the staggered double row on the 30 inch wide raised bed. We can also see the annual ryegrass growing nicely between the rows. Uh, the annual ryegrass helps stabilize the soil between the rows. It also gives us a little bit of wind protection for the developing strawberry plants. And the following spring when that uh, uh, cover crop is terminated, it gives us a, a uh, surface, a, a uh, carpet of plant material that we can walk on that gives us a good uh, operating surface. It also gives us a good surface to help keep, keep the uh, developing berries clean. So again, an estimated 14,700 plants per acre when the plants are planted in a six inch row spacing at 12 inches between, or six, I'm sorry, six foot row spacing and 12 inches between the plants. And again, just some, some shots of planting strawberries. And again, these are shots taken from an excellent uh, YouTube website and it's noted there on the slide that looks at not only the planting process but also the use of row covers. And uh, this video was shot at uh, Wallet's Farm in Kansas, and it was shot by uh, uh, researchers at Kansas State University. The upper picture shows the uh, water wheel transplanter. And uh, if you look at that, you see a couple of tanks, and within the tanks are a water nutrient solution. You then see the uh, strawberry plants, the plug plants within the trays, and then you see the crew of people. In this case, there's two people per, uh, per row that are actually placing the plugs. The lower picture shows the actual wheel, and the wheel has a metal teeth that pierce the plastic and create a hole in the soil in the raised bed, and then the plug plant is dropped into that hole. The spacing between plants is determined by the spacing between the metal teeth on the water wheel, and then the water wheel delivers a dose of the water nutrient solution as the hole is created. A very elegant way to, to plant large quantities of strawberries. And again, here's our uh, annual ryegrass cover. The uh, seeding rate is 50 pounds per acre, and it's important to brush the seed off of the row before the, uh, the uh, strawberry plug plants are planted. Management as we move into the fall. Uh, upon planting, the plants will begin to develop runners, and it's important to remove those runners as they form. We'll talk more about that here in a moment. We'll talk more about the use of row covers, but row covers are a tool that the annual plastic culture strawberry grower has to encourage growth later in the fall if needed. And then it's very important, of course, to keep these plants well watered uh, during the, the establishment and fall development period. So uh, some thoughts on what is happening in the strawberry plant in the fall. Uh, again, once we've planted the plug plants, we begin to see the development of runners anytime the day length gets to less than 10 hours and the temperatures get below 70. Uh, branch crowns will, will form also during the fall, uh, particularly as we see cool temperatures and short days. And we get the development of flower buds during this period of time as well. So anytime the, temp the uh, day length drops below, uh, I mentioned earlier, 14, uh, 14 hours, uh, 8 to 12 hours, even better. 
we see the development of flower buds. And this happens primarily in the fall. We get some flower bud development in the spring. And there, there are differences among uh, cultivars as well, as far as critical temperatures. I'm sorry, as, as far as critical day length. So again, our goal is to develop a strong, healthy, vegeta large vegetative plant in the fall. And looking at this picture, which we saw earlier, if we count those branch crown numbers, this is our goal. We can see five branch crowns in this picture. The plant should have the diameter of a dinner plate and ideally five to eight leaves. Keep in mind that small plants will not yield enough to make annual plastic culture plantings profitable. It's very important to get a strong, healthy, large plant in the fall. Now, some of the practices that will help encourage the development of those strong, healthy, large plants. Uh, first of all, runner removal. And uh, we can see here a runner being removed from a fall planted strawberry plant. These should be done uh, as they develop. They should be cut off, not pulled. If you pull them off, you risk damaging the crown. And runner removal should begin three to four weeks after transplanting, and it should be completed six weeks after transplanting. Now let's talk about floating row covers. Uh, this is a tool that is widely used in annual plastic culture strawberry production. Uh, as we saw earlier, it has a place in matted row production as well, but it's a very important part of managing annual plastic culture strawberries. These row covers are made out of spun bonded polypropylene. Uh, they're typically somewhere between one and a quarter to one and a half ounces per square yard. Uh, in some cases, lighter weights are used, but frequently, the uh, row covers will be within this, this range as far as the heaviness or, or weight of the fabric. Uh, frequently we see 60 foot widths used. A 60 foot width will cover 10 rows of strawberries that are planted on five and a half foot row centers. Now, how do we use floating row covers? Um, in the fall, we use floating row covers as a tool to help encourage a long enough growing period to develop, as we said, large plants that have sufficient numbers of branch crowns and sufficient flower bud development. Uh, if we have a fall that is a shortfall where we have cold temperatures coming on early, the use of row covers can actually lengthen the period of time for, uh, for uh, plants to develop. So this can be very helpful. If we're gonna use them in the fall, they should be applied when weekly temperatures begin to average somewhere in the neighborhood of 50 degrees Fahrenheit, and then left on place until the plants go dormant. Floating row covers can also be used during the winter. Uh, the goals of using floating row covers in the winter is protection from sublethal temperatures and also to protect the plants from damage from desiccation. Now, using row covers effectively in the winter is, is a bit of an art, okay? Timing is critical. And there's still a lot of discussion as far as when they should be placed during the winter. Frequently, it's based upon a critical minimum temperature. What is that critical minimum temperature? Well, again, this is where some of the disagreement is, but uh, it's reasonable to, to consider that temperature to be somewhere in the neighborhood of 15 to 20 degrees. It also depends upon the physiological state of the plants as well. Now, what about worm spells during the winter? The, the, the goal of management of strawberry plantings in the winter, whether they're, they're uh, perennial matted row systems or annual plastic culture systems, is to keep the plants dormant and in a, 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 a state of maximum hardiness. During warm spells, particularly if the plants are under a row cover, we can see the, uh, the uh, uh, breaking of dormancy and we begin to see plant development. And this can actually make the plants less tolerant of cold temperatures that would follow the warm spell. So if we have a period where there's a forecast for an extended warm spell, it's a good practice to take row covers off of plantings, particularly if these warm spells happen in, um, in uh, February or, or early March. And then as we move into March and April, dormancy will begin to break irregardless of, of uh, what's going on and cold sensitivity increases. And again, this becomes a period of time where we, we have to, uh, to think about risk. At this point, it's in uh, most cases, the strawberry beds are uncovered, but we wanna maintain the uh, row covers in a convenient location to pl place back over the plants if we do have frosts or cold periods that, that, uh, that then come. And on the subject of frost protection, row covers can be very helpful from the standpoint of managing frost. As I mentioned earlier, the uh, risk of a particular frost uh, event depends upon, first of all, the, the uh, predicted low temperature and also the stage of development of the strawberry blossoms. The more developed the strawberry blossoms are, the more likely they are to be de uh, damaged at warmer temperatures. Uh, frost protection is effective early in the spring. Keep in mind that uh, 
there is a risk to using row covers for frost protection. There can be damage to blossoms and foliage as we place the covers on and remove the covers, especially in windy conditions. And if we have to leave row covers in place for, for an extended period of time, let's say that we have uh, three to four days of, of a predicted frost, we can actually see some, some negative impacts from poor, poor flower pollination. So again, here's an example of uh, winter management with uh, row covers in place. Uh, we can see the edges of the row covers anchored with, with bags of rocks. Frequently bags of rocks or sandbags are used to anchor the edges of floating row covers. And again, in this case, this is a 60 foot wide uh, piece of row cover. We can see it covering multiple rows of strawberries. This is an interesting picture. In this case, the uh, farmer, uh, the row covers that the farmer was using were not quite long enough to cover the ends of the rows. And we can see a negative impact from the uncovered strawberries. Again, the uh, plants on the left were uncovered, the plants on the right were protected by the row covers from midwinter cold temperatures. And we can see that the uh, uncovered plants experience damage. So again, row covers can be a very useful tool from the standpoint of managing uh, strawberries during periods of, of sublethal temperatures. Spring management with the annual plastic culture system. When we remove row covers, typically in um, late winter, typically sometime in February, we then clean up the planting. We'll see what that looks like here in a moment. Set up fertigation units and overhead sprinklers if we're going to use those overhead sprinklers for frost management. We then move into the flowering period. And again, pollination management is important with annual plastic culture as it is with perennial matted row. Uh, frost management becomes very important during this time. Weekly nitrogen fertility management. Again, we're going to use our fertigation unit and we're going to inject fertilizers to, to provide the plants with needed amounts of nitrogen. Disease and insect management becomes important during this period of time. Harvest is earlier typically with annual plastic culture systems and we can begin harvesting as early as late April. And then after harvest, the planting is then discarded. Now, as we'll see here in a moment, the planting can be used for, uh, for uh, succession plants of plantings of other types of plants after the annual strawberries are removed. Hannah, do we have any questions at this point? Not at this time. <coughs> this this uh, picture shows uh, removal of the floating row covers in the spring. <clears throat> and again, it's typically going to be in February or the first week of March. Keep those row covers handy in case we need to place them back over the rows for, uh, for frost protection. This would be the, the uh, typical condition of strawberry plants when the row cover is removed. And we'll notice we have a number of, of uh, dead and dried leaves around the plants. Uh, leaving this uh, plant material in place can actually foster diseases. So it's a good practice to remove uh, these parts of the plants. And this can be done by gently raking the planting or by using a brush to, to remove the, uh, the uh, dried and dead leaves. <clears throat> Spring nitrogen fertility management. Uh, typically, uh, uh, annual plastic culture planting will require a total of 120 pounds of actual nitrogen per crop. We apply about half of that in, this, in the fall before we plant the plants. And then we apply the remainder in uh, weekly applications through our, our irrigation system in the spring. We begin when the first blossoms are visible. That's typically about the 1st of April. And we can also gauge the amount that we need and the rate that we apply based upon petiole tests. <clears throat> there are testing services in place that will uh, allow a grower to ship strawberry petioles. The sap within the petioles will be tested for nitrogen content. And then a recommendation will come back from the lab from the standpoint of the amount of nitrogen that needs to be uh, injected during a period of time. Typically, it's gonna be somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 pounds of calcium nitrate per week per acre. And this is applied for about eight weeks, again, starting when the first blooms are visible. Be cautious about applying too much nitrogen. This can lead to excessive uh, vegetated growth of the plants where the plants are too tall and the uh, fruit is then buried among the foliage. This reduces harvest efficiency and can lead to soft fruit. <clears throat> now remember our expected yields with the annual plastic culture are, are high, 26,250 pounds per acre. 
And the goal is to, to achieve 1.5 pounds of berries per plant. If we drop much below 1.5 pounds of berries per plant, it's questionable whether that planting will be profitable. And here's a, a picture, a post-harvest picture of a strawberry planting, annual plastic culture strawberry planting where the strawberry plants have been killed out and then a crop of squash planted back into the same raised bed. This can be an efficient way to use that raised bed. Uh, the irrigation system is already in place. There's oftentimes uh, nutrients that remain in the bed from the uh, strawberry crop and the following crop can utilize those nutrients and then the uh, bed and the irrigation system for, for a production cycle. Anna, do we have any questions about annual plastic culture strawberry production? Not at this time. Very good. Now let's talk about high tunnel strawberry production. And uh, this is probably the most recent development from the standpoint of strawberry production in the Midwest. And uh, it offers several advantages as we'll see here in the moment, but basically it's taking annual plastic culture production practices and moving them into a protective structure. <clears throat> advantages, the same advantages as annual plastic culture, but we overcome some of the risks of annual plastic culture by moving the strawberry planting into a protected environment. We can also achieve an early harvest. We can advance the harvest by as much as, as uh, three to four weeks uh, compared to a field grown strawberry planting by planting the same strawberries in a high tunnel. I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail because it's the same strategies as far as growing annual plastic culture plantings, but within a tunnel. Very important though, to manage high tunnel temperatures during the winter. Uh, we wanna be cautious about having too warm of a temperature during the winter time, because again, this can lead to uh, a plant to plants that have a lower level of winter hardiness. So it's very important to keep the plants within the high tunnel in a fully dormant state. And this is done by, by temperature management. We can use row covers inside hot tunnels during the winter, and the combination of row covers and closing the tunnel during periods of extreme cold can help protect the plants from, from midwinter damage. Uh, flowering and pollination management, uh, oftentimes the, uh, the uh, number of naturally occurring pollinators is reduced within the high tunnel environment. And particularly if, we're, if our goal is an early ripening crop, where we're encouraging early flowering. So there can be a benefit to provide pollinators within the high tunnel. And frequently what is used is bumblebees. So bumblebee hive is placed in the uh, high tunnel as the initial flowers open. Again, remember, as I said earlier, that those first blossoms that open are the uh, primary blossoms. They will develop into the primary fruit. And that's typically the largest fruit in the, uh, in the uh, 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 truss of, of blossoms and fruit. So it's important to put some time and energy into developing those, uh, those initial blossoms and initial fruit. Remember that harvest will be earlier than with field planting, so be prepared from the standpoint of your marketing. And I thought it might be interesting to take a quick look at what goes on inside a bumblebee hive. Um, you know, I've, I've worked with bumblebee hives over the years and you, you place the hive and, and the bumblebees come in and out, but I always wondered about the inner workings of a bumblebee colony. So recently I had a chance to, uh, to view an observation bumblebee hive, where basically a, a commercial hive was, was uh, opened up and we were allowed to look inside of it. So let's take a quick look at a video. Hannah, can we see the, uh, can we see the uh, video? Yes, that looks great. Oh, it just disappeared. Okay, go back here. Okay, can we see the video here? Yes, that looks great. Um, before we get started, there's uh, one question from yes. Andre. Um, day neutral varieties are June bearing in high tunnels. Uh, day neutral varieties will produce fruit at the same time as June bearing varieties when they're grown under annual plastic culture or within the high tunnel. Now, typically, of course, the, they're not maintained for production over the, uh, the uh, season. Uh, there are other settings where, where day neutral cultivars work quite well, you know, for example, winter production in greenhouses. But typically they're maintained or they're, they're used in annual systems where the plantings are discarded after that initial large harvest, just as, as you would with a June bearing cultivar in an annual production system. Okay, let's take a look at this here. Uh -huh. 
she's coming out a little bit. I, and I didn't know why is she messing with the larvae. You look closely, that, you can see the queen there at the very center. Oh, there's a cup there. She's getting maybe to uh, overposit in that cup. See, she's coming up. Oh, yeah. She's, she's got to get things just right. She's like a chicken. Got to get in that nest and turn around. That's what she's doing. Look at that. She's... And then I bet when that egg goes in, then the workers start to build a cell. See, she's ovipositing in the cell just below her, right now. Can you see the egg? Or is there even a cell there? That's good, because I didn't see a good cell. Anna, are we back to the presentation? We are, and there is a question in the chat. So, yes. Um, let's see. Andre asks, uh, what about fall production on high tunnel strawberries in regards to the day neutral varieties or June bearing in high tunnels? Okay, yeah, let me, let me get back here. So, um, Strawberries, uh, day neutral strawberries have certainly been grown for uh, season long production here in the Midwest. And they can be grown as a fall crop in the high tunnel. Uh, keep in mind the, the issue related to high temperatures and temperature control becomes important. If you wish to grow a, a late summer or fall crop, it'd be a good practice to provide uh, some uh, shade cloth over the high tunnel. The other issue has to do, as we'll see here in a moment, with spotted wing drosophila management. And strawberries are very attractive to spotted wing drosophila and several farmers have lost most of their crop because of issues with spotted wing drosophila management late in the season on strawberries. So before uh, embarking upon a late season production cycle with strawberries, very important to think about management of spotted wing drosophila. Okay, and we have another question. Uh, this one uh, is also from Andre. Um, Andy McNitt highly recommended day, uh, planting day neutral. I plant a row of Albion and a row of Monterey. I guess I'll see in the spring how it turns out. Excellent. Um, Andre, I'll look forward to hearing about your experiences. Uh, we have another question uh, from Christopher. What is the preferred soil type for strawberries? Will, will they do well in a heavy clay soil? The, the uh, ideal soil for growing strawberries would be a silt loam soil. Uh, even better would be a sandy silt loam soil, but most of us uh, have to be content with the silt loam soil. Heavier soils can be a challenge and growing strawberries on heavier soils is generally more successful using a raised bed and also supplementing organic matter content to that 5% level. Awesome, that's it on the chat for now. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm glad that day neutral production was brought up, uh, kind of touched on some of the basics, but yes, day neutrals could be used for a, a, uh, a type of production that would lead to summer and fall berries. Again, as I mentioned earlier, a couple of caveats. One is temperature uh, management. The other would be management of spotted wing drosophila. Greenhouse production during the winter. There's certainly the potential to grow both June bearing strawberries and day neutral strawberries during the winter in a climate controlled greenhouse. Now, keep in mind that you'll be competing directly with strawberries coming from warm production areas such as California, Mexico, and Florida. And it would be very important to, to think about the economics of doing this, but it certainly can be done. And if you have a premium market for locally grown strawberries during the winter, this might be something to consider. Strawberries are also a crop where there's the potential to grow them under hydroponics. Uh, they would be established typically in a, um, a thin film type system where they're grown in gutters. Uh, I have seen strawberries also grown in raft systems, but more typically they're grown in a thin film type system. And if anyone would like more information on hydroponic strawberry production, please reach out and I can share more resources. Now let's talk a little bit about strawberry integrated pest management. And remember that integrated pest management is not just uh, what do I spray to manage problems. It's an integrated approach looking at all of this management strategies that are available to farmers to manage disease and insect problems. 
Uh, in, in many cases, there are strawberries that have genetic resistance to diseases such as red steel or verticillium. And it would certainly be in the interests of uh, IPM to plant those cultivars here in the Midwest. Uh, also important to consider the, uh, the adaptation of strawberries and, and plant those strawberries that are hardy. Strawberries that have suffered winter damage are vulnerable to, to uh, disease issues. So on the disease side, Botrytis gray mold, anthracnose, leather rot, red steel, verticillium wilt, and leaf spots are, are seen with, with some regularity here in the Midwest. Uh, we'll see what these look like, or what several of these look like here in a moment. Among insect issues, plant bugs, mites, spotted wing drosophila, Japanese beetle, and stink bugs are the primary insects of interest. Now, rather than spend uh, a lot of time talking about uh, the tactics that are available to manage these, these uh, pests, I'm going to refer you to the Midwest Fruit Pest Management Guide. This is a guide that is uh, produced uh, to, by a specialist across the Midwest in consultation with farmers. Uh, the guide is produced every two years. Uh, the print form, uh, we're looking forward to a revision in 2021. The online form is revised at intervals as uh, pesticide labels change. Take a look at the guide. It has lots of information. It's not just a listing of sprays. It's a listing of management strategies. And uh, I encourage everyone to, to take a look at this particular guide from the standpoint of managing strawberry pests. Just some pictures to show you some common strawberry issues. Uh, in the center is Botrytis gray mold, a very common fruit rot on strawberries. Um, integrated pest management strategies for Botrytis gray mold include planting on raised beds, uh, include uh, not over fertilizing with nitrogen in the spring. This disease is always more of a problem if the berries are, are uh, buried within a dense canopy. So don't over fertilize your strawberries. Prompt removal of any rotted fruit is important. In fact, um, uh, organic farmers typically will, will uh, encourage pickers to take two containers, one container for sound fruit and one container for Botrytis gray mold. And it's worth paying people to pick rotted strawberries to get them out of the field as part of an overall management plan for Botrytis. Strawberry leaf spot in the upper picture there, uh, this disease can be managed by removing the foliage during renovation. You know, as I mentioned, uh, leaf removal can be part of the renovation practice and by removing these in leaves infected with leaf spots, we can actually break the leaf cycle or break the disease cycle for leaf diseases. Verticillium wilt, the lower picture, plant resistant cultivars and plant um, in ground that has not had strawberries, solanaceous crops or brambles growing on it for the past four to five years. Here are some common insect pests. The upper picture, upper right picture is tarnished plant bug. Feeding by tarnished plant bugs can lead to distorted berries. Uh, the lower picture in the center is the Japanese beetle. And Japanese beetle is not much of an issue on annual systems because by the time the beetles emerge and become damaging, the plantings have been discarded. But it can certainly impact perennial matted row plantings. Brown marmorated stink bugs and other stink bugs can cause problems on, on berries as far as distorted berries as well. Spotted wing drosophila there in the upper center picture. Now, management strategy, spotted wing drosophila, again, is primarily an issue on uh, day neutral plantings that are, are uh, in place for, for summer and fall production. Again, the, uh, the uh, spring crop of strawberries, wh whether it's perennial matted row or annual plastic culture, frequently is harvested before spotted wing drosophila numbers build. Japanese beetle can be managed by trapping. Uh, Stink bugs and tarnished plant bugs are more of a challenge and typically they are managed the use of, uh, of labeled insecticides. There are other strawberry pests that can become a problem. Uh, nematodes. Nematodes are tiny uh, worms, sometimes microscopic worms, live in the soil that feed on strawberry roots and can result in lower bigger plants or sometimes even plant death. Uh, it's a good practice to do a nematode test on a site before planting and if there are high levels of damaging nematodes, it may be best to avoid that site from the standpoint of strawberry production. Slugs and snails can be a problem. And from the standpoint of managing slugs and snails, uh, they can be baited. They can also be uh, trapped within uh, uh, various types of traps with organic baits. Mice and other rodents can be an issue. Mice and other rodents frequently are managed by trapping as well. 
where am I maintaining uh, habitat for their, their predators? Birds, if birds become an issue, the plants can be, plantings can be protected through the use of netting. Deer can be a serious issue on strawberries. And in fact, I remember uh, a situation several years ago where, where three acres of strawberries were lost over one weekend by a deer coming in and grabbing the plants, jerking them out of the ground and then eating them. Uh, deer management is best done with, with electrified or barrier fences. And then viruses can be a strawberry problem as well. Always important to source planting stock from nurseries that have a program in place to test their plants for virus problems. Do we have any questions at this point, Hannah? It doesn't appear as so. Um, yeah, no questions at this time. Let's talk about strawberry harvest. So harvest begins about 30 days after flowering starts. So if your first flowers open in uh, the first week in April, your first harvest will typically be in the first week of May. Again, remember in the high tunnel, we can have flowering as early as, uh, as late March, which can of course give us a crop sometime in, I'm sorry, as, as early as early March, we can give us a crop as early as uh, early April. Harvest uh, varies at least three times per week. And in warm seasons, they may need to be harvested more frequently than that. Berries should be picked as ripe as possible. Uh, berries do not improve in quality after harvest. So we wanna pick berries that are fully ripe. Now, how do we know if a berry is fully ripe? Uh, the berries should be completely uh, colored. There should be no white tip or lighter colored tip uh, on the fruit. And uh, the berries though sh should be harvested before they begin to soften. So again, this is why a, a harvest needs to be uh, quite regular during the uh, season. The uh, berry should be picked with a stem attached for a longest shelf life. If you pick the berry and the, the stem, and especially if the calyx are removed, this can, can greatly shorten the shelf life of strawberries. And particularly if these berries are gonna be marketed off the farm, it's important to leave the stems attached for the longest shelf life. Berries should be picked into shallow marketing containers. Typically, you don't want a depth of more than four to five berries uh, in the uh, harvest container. Uh, anything deeper than that will lead to crushed fruit in the bottom. And berries should be harvested early in the day, uh, before 10 o'clock if at all possible. At this point, the berries are still fully turgid and uh, they'll be a maximum size. If you delay harvest until later in the day, uh, the berries will have lost moisture to desiccation and you can lose up to 10% of fruit volume by harvesting late in the day versus harvesting early in the day. As soon as the fruit is harvested, it should be cooled down immediately to maximize shelf life. And if the berries are gonna be held for, for any length of time, they should be stored at about 35 degrees Fahrenheit. A uh, strawberry, if it's harvested at the proper time when it's fully ripe and ca handled carefully, cooled immediately and then put into storage as soon as possible, has about a five day shelf life. You need six to 10 pickers per acre to harvest strawberries at the peak of harvest for a given cultivar. Now remember that the primary fruit ripen first. Typically the first harvest on strawberries will be about 15 to 20% of the harvest off that plant. The majority of harvest will come in the second week of ripening. This is when you need that six to 10 pickers per acre. For pick your own harvest, frequently uh, the uh, farmer will provide a four quart basket or a four quart busket. That lower picture is a busket. It's a ventilated plastic pail, again, that is, is wider than it is deep. Uh, cardboard flats can also be used for harvesting strawberries. Now for pre-picked berries, they're frequently harvested into plastic clamshells that are, are a quart in size. In some cases, uh, berries are harvested into smaller containers, but growers report that it's difficult to, to provide an attractive pack in anything less than a quart size container but a quart, quart and a half or two quart containers are frequently used and plastic clamshells are, are widely used as well. Some growers are harvesting into pulp containers as we see in the upper picture and then the berries can be left open or they can be covered with a, plastic, a piece of plastic film that's secured with a rubber band. Strawberries are a valuable crop. The fresh market price is somewhere between three to four dollars per pound for pick your own and five dollars per pound for pre-picked berries. Uh, they're well suited for pick your own marketing. They're also excellent berries from the standpoint of on-farm sales through farm stands. Uh, they can be taken off farm and sold through farmers markets or as part of a CSA share. 
uh, locally grown strawberries have a role from the standpoint of wholesale markets. And increasingly, we're seeing strawberry farmers who are marketing to schools or to institutional markets or even to, to uh, wholesale brokers. And as we mentioned at the beginning of the class, there are value added opportunities for strawberries. You know, traditional products such as jellies, jams, or sauces, or strawberries can be incorporated into a more creative value added products as well. There's an excellent strawberry enterprise budget uh, at this website. I'm not going to go into details with it, but I encourage you to consider checking this out, particularly if you are a new strawberry grower. There are enterprise budgets for both uh, field grown strawberries and high tunnel strawberries at this site through the University of Missouri. Now some general thoughts on planning a strawberry enterprise. Uh, definitely it's important to plan. If you're new to strawberries, you need to learn about strawberry production and you need to understand what it takes for success. Again, strawberries are a management intensive, labor intensive, input intensive crop. The potential is there for, for profit, but it's important that you understand what it takes to produce a successful crop. Remember that there's risk, particularly for annual plastic culture. And you wanna consider all of the risk management strategies that are at your disposal. Again, the use of things such as floating rug covers, considerations such as growing under protected culture. Remember that the price and the return varies with location and market and know what your potential market is. Think about your yields and be prepared to market a high yielding planting, okay? But again, recognize that there can be, can be uh, stresses, risks that can lower productivity in a strawberry planting. Annual plastic culture does have the potential for higher yield than perennial matted row. But remember that the investment is also much larger with annual plastic culture. Remember that the actual cost to establish and maintain a strawberry planting varies with location, with the type of system you choose, and with your management practices. Your main variable costs are planting material, about 25% of, of, of inputs. Your labor, that's about another 25% of, of inputs. And I mentioned fumigation here. Increasingly, fumigation is not used in strawberry plantings, particularly under organic plantings, but we are seeing some use of biofumigants, the use, for example, of uh, uh, mustard cover crops that are, that are grown and then turned into the soil. And this can amount to uh, up about 10% uh, of production costs. The main fixed costs are your freeze and frost control. You know, the uh, floating row covers are uh, actually a fixed cost because you can use them for several years. And that fencing we mentioned against deer. Some good resources, the Midwest Small Fruit Pest Management Handbook that I re referenced earlier. There's a companion guide called the Midwest, I'm sorry, the, uh, the Midwest Fruit Spray Guide that I mentioned earlier, but also the Midwest Small Fruit Pest Management Handbook, which is a companion to the uh, spray guide. The uh, Midwest Strawberry Production Guide is available as a free downloadable PDF, so check that out. There's also uh, organic fruit production guides, including organic strawberry production guides available from Cornell University and from the, uh, the uh, uh, organization ATRA. So check out these two websites. And then the University of Missouri has produced a strawberry cultivar guide, which is um, publication G6135. So we've covered a lot of material relative to strawberry production. And I always like to close with a picture of a grandchild enjoying a fresh strawberry. You can see my grandson there uh, having a strawberry. Does anyone have any questions related to strawberry production? Uh, not at this time. Um, actually, I'm not sure if we answered this question. Um, correct me if, if we have. Andre asked, what about aphids? I had to spray rocos in the high tunnel a couple of days ago. The Chandler's next row over are still free of aphids. Yes, um, particularly in high tunnel uh, production systems, aphids can very quickly become a serious issue. Now, managing aphids uh, in an integrated pest management strategy uh, has several possible uh, management approaches. First of all, of course, don't over fertilize. You don't want to develop too dense of a canopy where the aphids can, can take off and build to damaging levels before you even know they're there. Secondly, uh, consider the use of aphid predators. And a number of these predators can be introduced effectively into a high tunnel. These would include predators such as lady beetles and lacewings. Uh, consider using uh, 
uh, soft insecticides inside the high tunnel. You know, there could be some effectiveness, for example, in using uh, uh, soap-based insecticides in a high tunnel environment. But again, use them uh, as directed by the label and be a bit cautious if you're using them during periods of, of warm temperatures. And then there are uh, organic insecticides, which can give some relief from, from aphids, as well as conventional insecticides that could be used as well. That looks like it's it on the chat. Okay, very good. Um, at this point, if anyone would like to unmute, you're welcome to do that. Let me go ahead and escape here from this. Um, it seems as though the attendees cannot unmute. Um, do you mind making me host so I can I can review that? Yes, hold on just a moment and I will do that. Hmm. We're getting a lot oh, wow. of thank yous. Uh, thank you from Rita. Thank you from Angie. Um, thank you from Danielle. Everybody's saying thank you. Thank you, Patrick. <laughs> My pleasure, of course. Um, I'm sorry, I'm not finding the ability to unmute people. Yeah, I'm not sure if that's... that's. Oh, here we go, here we go. Okay, okay uh, I think I've allowed people to unmute themselves. So oh. if... Uh, Thank you from Memphis, Tennessee. Oh, thank you. Excellent. <laughs> so at this point, if anyone would like to unmute themselves, uh, feel free to do so and we can have a conversation. Gail says thank you as well. Thank you all for saying thank you. And again, please remember to uh, participate in the uh, survey to give us some feedback on the uh, presentation. Let's see. Paul, I think I think I've allowed you to uh, t talk now. I think you had a question earlier. Andre has also said that she cannot unmute or they cannot unmute. Paul, are you there? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, oh, do you have a question? Paul. Okay. Paul, I'm going to mute you back, and uh, we can come back to you here in just a moment. Andre, I think you're unmuted as well, if you'd like to ask a question. Yeah, so regarding the high tunnel strawberry, so thanks, Patrick, for this, because uh, I have a lot of questions, because my first time ever growing high tunnel strawberry, so uh, a lot of new things. Like I mentioned earlier, Andy McNitt highly recommends using the Bay Nutra varieties, and, you know, I was kind of, you know, surprised at first, but he said try them out see how they are, and then you'll you'll thank me in the spring. So I did plant uh, Albion, Monterey, Chandler's, and Rocco's in the high tunnel. So, you know, the hardest thing about the uh, day neutral varieties is pulling off all the flower buds, you know, because you want all the energy to go in the spring. So that's why I was asking about fall production. And, you know, if there's any, any more about fall production strawberries, you know, I'll look into it because, you know, planting the uh, day neutral varieties in – you know, first week of October, you know, they're still pushing that flower, but even now they're still, you know, the flowers are coming out and out even more or so. Yeah, so I, I'll comment on that. It, it's a typical practice with day neutrals to remove the blossoms for four to six weeks after planting, again, to give the plants a chance to establish. Uh, day neutrals are also a, a little bit less prolific from the standpoint of runners. I mean, they will form runners, obviously, but uh, perhaps not as much as a June bearing cultivar would. And uh, depending on when you plant them, you know, once you move beyond this four to six week period, then they will start to produce blossoms, uh, again, dependent upon temperature, as we move through the summer and into the fall. Now you could plant them in late summer and then, uh, you know, again, remove blossoms for a period of time and then allow them to begin to fruit in the fall. That would be an option. And in fact, that's the approach that's taken for uh, climate controlled greenhouse production. You plant them in the fall and then uh, once they're established, you, you maintain the right temperature and perhaps some sub supplemental lighting during short days during the winter to encourage flower bud formation more or less continuously during the winter. So that same approach, I think, Andre, could be used for, uh, for a fall crop on day neutral strawberries. Now, it's been our experience that if you try to carry them beyond, um, well, let's say you planted in, in summer, had some fall berries, you had a, an additional spring crop on them, 
and then you were interested in carrying them on through the next summer and then into the, the next season. It's been our experience that you have so many branch crowns develop that the result is smaller fruit. So there's not much uh, benefit to carrying them on beyond that original production cycle. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it's just, I'm trying to get as much information as I can, but yeah, day neutrals are always always finicky and pretty cool to mess with, I guess. So I guess I guess I got to take Andy's word for it. I'll see in the spring if I got to thank him or not. So well, keep keep me post keep me posted on how they develop. I'll definitely be watching those. Yeah, awesome. I will. So, but feel free to come by the farm. You know where we are. So I do know. Thank you, Andre. Yes, thank you. Okay. I'm do we have anyone else who is interested in being unmuted? Uh, there's no one in the chat right now. There was a question, um, where do we fill out the survey? You will be prompted to fill out the survey at the end of this Zoom. Um, so at the end of this Zoom call, um, once you exit, there will be a survey to fill out at the end. And please fill out the survey. It's very helpful for us. And again, I'll thank everyone for attending. And if you have any questions that we didn't cover tonight, you'd like more information about strawberry production, please feel free to reach out. Um, I'm in the Webster County University of Missouri Extension office and you can give them a call or, or drop me an email and, and I'll be happy to visit with you about strawberries. Yeah, and also feel free to comment on, um, on any of our Springfield Community Gardens uh, posts in regards to this. Um, this will be pre-recorded and posted to YouTube, so feel free to comment and we will directly message Patrick for any questions. And I'll mention too that we have a series of workshops coming up over the next months. Uh, in December, we'll have workshops on produce food safety and on uh, uh, basic beekeeping. So that's coming up. And then we have a number of workshops as we move into 2021. And at least until the uh, COVID situation uh, uh, is behind us, these will all be virtual workshops and anyone is welcome to join us on the, uh, the workshops. And again, stay tuned, watch the uh, Springfield Community Gardens uh, Facebook page for notification of the meetings or check out the Webster County University of Missouri Extension uh, Facebook page for information on the meetings. So thank you very much for joining us tonight. We have uh, another question from Frank. Ah. <laughs> uh, Frank says, do you have any idea how many acres are planted in Missouri? You know, that's how a good acres? question. Yeah, acres of strawberries. So the, uh, Data, the only data that we have that, that are helpful in that is the, the uh, reported data in the census of agriculture. And that always is an underestimation of, of the acreage. And if I remember the data from the most recent census uh, correctly, it's somewhere in the, in, in the vicinity of about three to 500 acres. Now, exactly what it is is hard to say, but uh, that would be the reported acreage. Awesome. Uh... Andre says that they planted 2.5 acres this year. That's awesome. Great. Um, yeah, it looks as though we still have 16 participants on the call. So um, y'all feel free to reach out via chat if you would like to be unmuted so that we can answer any of your questions. Gonna give it a minute or two. Yeah, just put a note in chat and I'll unmute you. There was a question, uh, what is the YouTube channel? The YouTube channel is Springfield Community Gardens. Um, so if you, and it would, it would be great if you guys uh, could subscribe, uh, you would have access to all of our previous workshops as well as all of our future workshops and you would be notified when those are uploaded. Um, again, the YouTube channel is called Springfield Community Gardens. And I'll mention too, I'll go ahead and drop my email into the chat. Uh, if you'd like to reach out, I'd be happy to send you a schedule for all of the upcoming workshops. Awesome. Gail uh, would like to be unmuted. Just a moment, Gail.
Can okay. you hear me? Yep, you should be unmuted. Okay, uh, this is our first year. We're in Kentucky and we've put out like an acre and a quarter of Chandler in the plastic culture. Mm -hmm. And we've planted them the first week in September and we have had to cut runners three times and mow the ryegrass three times. Is this unusual? I know we've had a warmer fall than usual, but uh, I'm wondering if I should have delayed planting maybe another week, because we did no, the first week, first week of September. No, uh, Gail, I think this is actually pretty typical, and you're right, it has been a warm fall, and uh, we have seen, I say we, the, the farmers that I visited with have seen a, a lot of runner production this fall, but no, this this is what what you'll expect. I mean, you have to, as we stressed in the presentation, you have to plant the right time. Uh, if you were to plant earlier, you would see even more runners. Uh, if you planted later, you run the risk of uh, of uh, not getting plants large enough as you move into the colder part of the fall. So it's it's a good practice to target that early September period of time. We have a question from Christopher. Christopher asks, um, do you have a recommendation or a recommended supplier for buying plants? Uh, Christopher, again, I'll, I'll refer you to the uh, Cornell University Berry Nursery website. And I tell you, Hannah, can you do a quick search for that? Yeah. Um, Cornell University Berry Nursery. And then once we find that, we'll drop that into the chat. I find that to be extremely useful, not just for strawberries, but for any berry crop that you might be interested in sourcing. Uh, nurseries are on that list, you know, that they, they request to be on the list, but in general, the nurseries that are on that list are reputable nurseries that have a, a, a long track record of supplying good quality nursery plants. Okay, Patrick, I'm uh, entering the link in the chat. Please confirm that that's the correct website. Yes, that's the correct website. Would anyone else like to be unmuted? Thank you, Christopher. Very good. Well, again, please feel free to reach out um, if you'd like more information about strawberries or if you'd like uh, uh, schedule the upcoming workshops. I wanna thank everyone for joining us tonight and I want to thank my, my colleague, Hannah, for moderating and keeping us on track and checking the chat and all the other things that go into making a successful online workshop. So with that, I think we will go ahead and close down tonight and look forward to, to seeing people on future workshops. See you soon.